Hi there. For the 75th anniversary of the Ontario District of the Barbershop Harmony Society, we are doing a series of interviews with iconic Ontario District barbershoppers. My name is Steve Armstrong, and it is my distinct honor to be spending time reminiscing with each of these uh, men who are all uh, personal heroes of mine. Uh, today we're going to spend time talking with Ron Whiteside. Ron is um, best known as being a, a sound coach and uh, you know one of the key contributors to the Dukes of Harmony rise to uh, first of all a silver medal in 1976 and then ultimately two gold medals in 77 and 1980. Uh, first of all Ron, uh, welcome and thank you for uh, spending some time uh, chatting with me. And thank you, Steve, and thanks for doing this. And uh, you did miss a couple, a couple of the more complimentary. <laughs> you, icon was good, but a few more complimentary words that I wrote oh, yeah. for you, 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 well, you skipped a couple of those. I, yeah, I did some editing on it, Ron. I, I, I want you to look good. I hate that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, let, let, never mind that. On with the show. All right. Um, I, 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 I cut out the part where you said extremely humble. I'm, uh, you know. <laughs> I know. Well, that was what, what the problem I had with the Jeff Pritchard Award. <laughs> that humility clause kept me out of it for ever so long. Time. Exactly. But you did end up getting it. I still haven't got it yet. <laughs> I did. Well, who knows? Um, so I'd like to start by going back to the very beginning. So what, what year did you join? 1957, Okay. Eddie Russell and Jack Nash and I were playing basketball. We had finished high school. I was in my first year university. And the three of us were playing junior basketball at Wood Green Community Center in what, what was called a, a park uh, league. The senior team had Eddie's older brother, uh, Jimmy, on it. And at some point late in, I think it was December of 56, his wife, Jimmy's wife, Joan, worked with a guy named Ralph Carter, who is a member of the Scarborough chapter, of S -B -E -B -S -Q -S -A. Ralph said to Joan, what would your husband be interested in coming out to barbershop? He said, he's got a good bass voice, he might. So Jimmy went out in 56 and joined and liked it. Eddie and uh, our coach, Ernie Moores was an East York barbershopper, okay. our junior coach. So Eddie and Jack went out one night and uh, to Scarborough because East York was full. They only had a small hall and they had a cap on their membership and a waiting list of about 30 people, if you can believe it. I wow. can't believe it. Anyway, all in all, it was uh, people were clamoring to get in. Anyway, so. Eddie and Jack went out to Scarborough one night. I didn't have a car, so and I wasn't interested, frankly. Anyway, they came back raving about it. So they conned me into going, Eddie said, I'll pick you up, and which he did for about three, the first three years, and take you out and we'll see what happens. Well, I got out there, they got up in, at coffee time and sang, you're as welcome as the flowers in May, May I'm caught. So anyway, at the end of the night, a group of them gathered together and made us a quartet. Jack couldn't harmonize, so he was the lead. Eddie always sang a third above when we were singing a bus, a team bus or whatever. And so he became the tenor. I got the baritone. Right. At the time, it was, I thought, you got to be kidding, as I think most people do when they hear baritone. First year baritone, yeah. Exactly so. <laughs> However, after a while, I got, oh, I get this. This is, this is, this fascinates me. And it held, held my, to this day, baritone really holds my interest. Yeah. Uh, we started to, sometime in there, we started to woodshed a little bit. And when you, we found a chord, my goodness, we were so excited. All that and meeting Gordon Lightfoot briefly and uh, not knowing where he was going, George Shields, took us under his wing. And frankly, I don't know if I'd be here 65 years later right. had it not been for George Shields. Now, had you sung before or...? or? We always sang around the family piano. Okay. Two of my uncles played uh, piano, one by ear and one could read. And uh, they, they, every time we went to my grandparents, my maternal grandparents, my 
mother was one of eight and had four brothers and they all loved to sing. They weren't very good, but they loved to sing. My grandfather was an amazing re uh, Renaissance man. He did everything really well, including singing. Anyway, uh, we would stand, we'd stand around the piano and every time we went there for a party or Christmas or whatever it may be. So you started singing baritone, but you didn't know how to read music? Is that no, still right? don't. Well, you know, it's worth mentioning Eddie Russell because because yeah. Eddie, uh, and, you know, a longtime friend of yours, of course, right from the very beginning, but sang with the Hometowners uh, all those years, and then also with the Canadian Heritage, uh, many, many more times in the top 20. So uh, one of the all-time great Ontario district tenors. Loved that quartet. We laughed together. We enjoyed everything. And just enjoyed performing, enjoyed just singing. Yeah, for sure, it was. So the quartet, that's not the whole name though, right? Well, there was a T which was being promoted at that time called the T that dares to be known by good taste alone. <laughs> okay. We were the quartet that dares to be known by bad taste alone. <laughs> but the quartet uh, ended up winning the interior district. So what year was that? 67. Okay. Yeah. So that was a while later. Meanwhile, we had uh, changed parts somewhat. Harry Wilson uh, became our lead and Jack Gordon became our tenor. Two characters, to say the least. And that, that was, um, their characters are still out there in barbershop. I'm, I don't mean to knock modern barbershop by any means, because yeah. I don't, I really don't. But characters, I was a teacher and it was true in education too. Characters became very rare. And that was a wonderful part of growing up for me in barbershop. And I had so many good laughs, good moments, good experiences with people yeah. that way. Still do. Okay, so uh, moving on from there. So th we're in the late 60s, early 70s by this point, right? Uh, in the early 70s, yeah. We, uh, I had been, we had, in the, in the meantime, the Scarborough Chorus had won the district in 59, much to our surprise. And who was the director then? It's Les Collins, okay. who left us shortly after that. Okay. Then we got Dick Pooley, who from East York, he was a baritone in a, uh, a champion quartet called the Tone Sifters. Okay. And Dick was a, a sort of a self-taught musician, really nice man, and he took over the chorus and he got us to our first international in 1962 in uh, Kansas City. In 66, I was the president, and, uh, which was my only time on, on the board, ever, ever, anywhere, ever. How, how did you never serve on the board and then go right into president? <laughs> uh, well, it wasn't easy to find anybody to stand. For, like, as is probably true most, most yeah. places. So eventually I thought, okay, I'll do it. Anyway, we, uh, Dick had gotten us in, in 65. We won the district, well, won the international uh, prelim right. to go to uh, Chicago. So consequently, I, I had to do a lot of arranging, etc. But Dick, at, before Christmas, had a heart attack. So Ron Crapper, the baritone in, in uh, the hometowners, stepped in and, uh, and directed us. He hated it and didn't want to do it, okay. so he was done then. So we'd been twice, and we went to uh, what was then the, um, the, lead, the leader school uh, in January. Cot school? Cot school, of course. Right. Chapter officer trainers, training school. And uh, w Gareth Evans was there, baritone in the Rhythm Airs. And we talked to Gareth. We plied him with drink and uh, <laughs> talked him into coming as our director. And he did. And that was, that was definitely a major plus for us. Gareth uh, took us to two more internationals in 72 and 73. And in 73, he'd said, I don't want to do this anymore. I've had enough. I want a quartet and nothing else. And so anyway, he stepped down. Now we're without a director. Well, the rest, as they say, is kind of history. I, um, 
I had gone to what was then called a HEP school, Harmony Education Program, in Reading, Pennsylvania, in, yeah. in uh, 1970, uh, where I encountered Mac Huff. And I took his quartet coaching uh, class, and he taught me really what is uh, classical singing s stuff. He, he, I think he would trained operatically, Mac, in Texas. And uh, at any rate, he taught such things as a pojo breathing and, uh, and so on. Sing from the epigastrium. To this day, I'm not sure what an epigastrium is, but he, he taught a lot of things that got me fascinated by vocal technique. And I went back and I told Gareth about it, and he said, can you teach the chorus? I said, well, I can try. So I did. I spent, vocal, I spent some vocal time for the next three years, and so I was asked to be the director. I said, no way. I can't read music. I don't know music. I am not a director. I can't be a director for you. But you're a teacher. I was a teacher. And that's, I mean, that may have entered into the process. I don't know. Right. Anyway, I, uh, I said, okay, I'll do it for the summer, the rest of the summer. You've got to find somebody. Well, we didn't go into, into the competition that fall in order to try and get to another international because I certainly wasn't ready and the chorus certainly wasn't ready. Not a, a lot of guys had dropped out in 73. We had maybe 75 guys in the chorus. Oh. Only 44 went to Portland. Right. I, re I remember this when I was directing the Dukes. That was still, that still affected decisions. People were worried about a long trip. They remembered what it was like going to Portland. And every week, another guy would be dropping out. And, you know, you start with 75, you get down to... 44. Yeah. I remember it only too well. So consequently, uh, we didn't go in that year. And I just continued because here was the problem, Steve. I, I coached at school. I coached sports at school. And so I didn't get home till 6.30. If I was going to get out to the, on time to the chapter, I had to leave immediately. Right. No supper. Didn't like that too well. So anyway, I continued to do it and went on. And in 74, we went into competition. We'd gotten pretty good, I thought. To my ear, we were sounding pretty good. It was at the Skyline Hotel out by the airport, now gone. Yeah. And it was a makeup, uh, jack together stage, which moved when we moved. Yeah. And there was no feedback sound, and the guys just froze. And we were so far below our cap capabilities, and yet we were second by three points. I was moved to stay another year. Okay. Because I knew that we were a lot better than that. Well, next fall, uh, 75, we won by 100 points. And that was very gratifying. I loved that. Right. However, in the meantime, now we're going to another international in San Francisco. And we're going to do pretty well in my, in my mind. Right. Most of the guys are saying, you know, we'll never win a medal. We'll never beat Louisville, et cetera, et cetera. And it sounded like there could be a lot of truth in that. But they didn't, they didn't stand out in front and hear what was going on. Right. So they didn't really realize and say, yeah, I think you might be surprised. Anyway, uh, when we got to San Francisco, meantime, I had been looking for another director. I only found one guy that I thought could carry this on, and that was Ray Danley. He was an assistant director at... Uh, at East York at the time. And as you know, assistant directors don't get much time in most right. choruses. So anyway, uh, I thought, well, I'll talk to him and see what he thinks. I don't want to be a, a pirate, but this guy could do this job. No, I think you guys, you got to know each other. At Harmony College, I broached the subject on a plane, yeah. Okay. So anyway, so, now we're called, Ron Brown and I did not get back into the auditorium, which was the Cow Palace, a big arena at, at that point. We're standing at a curtain doorway listening to the results. We'd been, I don't know, held up somewhere. Everybody else, of course, is up in the stands. And the story goes that they called fifth and it wasn't us. And a lot of people gave up. 
Yeah, because I had heard that the guys, the biggest thing they wanted at that time, uh, the Barbershop Harmony Society would do a record and the top five choruses would get on the record, only the top five. Yeah, that's And right. the goal was, we want to make the record. Right? That's probably right. Yeah. One to get a medal, one to make the record. Right. Exactly. And so. so when they said fifth and it wasn't the Dukes of Harmony. Uh, clearly, it's, uh, clearly it's not us. Yeah. Fourth, more people quit. Third, oh, that's absolutely. Yeah. I'm standing there. On, uh, this is, <laughs> as I swear, this is the truth. Yeah. I'm standing there thinking, oh, my goodness, we've won this thing. Because you, because you heard it, you were out, out in front of it every week. You knew how good it, it got. couldn't. It couldn't have been better. That we right. we had a great, great hit in San Francisco. Right. We sang the sweetest song in the world, and we had worked and worked and worked on that thing. I'd I'd stolen ideas from Gracie Fields of all things <laughs> on how to sing that song. She was one of a few that I'd heard recorded with it, and she did a gliss toward the end. Well, I can't think of what it was, but I I threw that gliss in. And Don Claus, who was coaching us at the time, added a little bit to it, and, and well, it, it was really good, really good. Hard for us Joe Barber shoppers to do properly. It was uh, it was a tough arrangement, but um, it was one of my favorite memories. And I thought we could have won, and in fact, we did win sound. Yes. So that was great, but it was time for me to get out. No. Just to make sure everyone realizes, you came in second place. You got a silver medal. That was the first medal for the Dukes, right? Oh, for sure. Yeah. For sure. And just just a few years before that, you had been what? Uh, ninth. Ninth. In '73. Right. We were eighth in '72. We were uh, eighth in '66. But in '62, we were sixth. So that was a huge rise. And you know, I've talked to you about this before, how it happened. Um, and it sounds like a lot of that work, when you started doing the vocal production stuff that you had learned from Mac Huff, you're building the foundation, building the skills in the chorus. Trying uh, to, yes. Yeah. Uh, it's not easy, for sure. Here, I think, you know, there's a lot of positives in this situation. I get, at that time, got a lot of credit. I was told that I did it single-handedly, and that was great for my ego, but absolutely not true. It just doesn't work that way. I mean, I was, I was important. I was a catalyst. Uh, I brought the concept to, to the chorus that worked. But so many things. We had been to four internationals. We had good singers in the group. We had really strong administrators. We had, uh, I had been in the, in the chorus for, at that point, for what? 15 years, 13, 16 years. And so when I started, and, and getting on for 20 at, toward the end. So consequently, I, I had their interest. I'd done everything with these guys for that many years. Right, the relationships. Uh, exactly. Right. And so they put up with me. Right. I mean, I, I know it could be tedious. Do it again, do it again, do it again. And the, I, I would see the eyes roll. And I got that. I would think, you know, it was so important to communicate with the guys. And, the, and I always looked around, and I always watched how they were reacting. And it went from that feedback. But that kind of thing, uh, I don't think that could have been done in very few, in a lot of situations. If I hadn't been a member of that chapter for that length of time, right. if I hadn't been exposed to Mac Huff, et cetera, et cetera, those things wouldn't happen. And I, I had to learn. I mean, I had to learn to listen. When I started, I would think, something wrong with that chord. And I'd, guys, sing that again, please. Sing it again. And now I maybe recognize what was wrong. Got to the point where I could kind of run my ear down the chord and say, oh, okay, that, this has to happen. One of the things I would listen for is, is harmonics, overtones. And that, that is a big help in the whole situation. Right. Anyway, it was a very exciting time, yeah. but Ray came to me just before we went to, uh, went to mm, Philadelphia for our first gold and said, you know, you should direct this. <laughs> no, I shouldn't. Really? Just before? Like well, when you said just before? Maybe, maybe a month before. So you're a month, it's a month before they're going to win, you're going to win, and raise the director and he comes back to you and says, I should go, I should go, because 
Well, this, the groundwork was yeah. with me directing. Well, I, I know when I've, when I've spoken to Ray about this period of time, he has said that he always considered the 1977 gold medal to be yours, that, that you were the one that had, you know, as the director, he felt that you were really the one that had taken the course. And I certainly appreciate that, but frankly, it's not that simple. Oh, well, I, I know that, I know that. Yeah. But um, I, I've always admired uh, your graciousness in looking at this. I mean, I don't know how many people in the world with, um, you know, being the director of a gold medal chorus, I mean, for me that was, that was a highlight of my barbershop life. And if, if I knew this the year before, there's a good chance that this would happen, but someone else came along that I thought might serve the course better, would I have the humility to you know, pass the torch? I don't know. Let me, let me quote Jim Henry. It's not the gold medals, and I believe this at that time, yeah. it's the gold medal moments. I had said so many gold medal moments, Steve, that some of the things, I admire some of the people that, uh, that stood up there under bad circumstances and health circumstances and, and still were loyal to the whole thing. And oh my goodness, it's, it, it was just so, yeah. so much life information that I picked up from, from Barbershop. And certainly that was an issue. So the gold medal, you know where my, medal, where my medals are? including the gold, they're in a box somewhere under the stairs in the cellar. I and so I, I that, that, that really, honest to me, that wasn't important. I knew a lot of people, I, I met a lot of people, and a lot of people I really liked, and I met, I loved my, my barbershop experience at Scarborough, so why would I uh, need a gold medal? That right. was the way I felt. It struck me right away that this is a chorus that worked hard but then would get relief by just laughing, you know, and, and you were one of the, you know, the architects of that because you, you have a, a great wit and there were a few other people. Well, Eddie Russell was a great one-liner. Harry um, Wilson. Harry Wilson. Tom Burns. Tom Burns. Oh, my gosh. That was kind of our culture. We were irreverent. Yes. Uh, we were often profane. Yes. But, you know, I, I worried about that sometimes. Again, I always scan the chorus. Part of my feedback as a teacher is to look into the eyes of my, clue, my class, my crew. And if I got feedback that said, uh, don't do that, please, or I'm bored, or whatever, that meant a lot. So I would worry about saying, taking a shot at one of our newer men. Right. On more than one occasion, I can't remember, I can't, quote a number, more than one occasion, I would take the time at a break to go to the man I'd, I'd shot, take a shot at and say, listen, I hope I didn't insult you. Inevitably, the answer was something along the lines of, are you kidding? That's the first time I really felt a part of this. So that was the culture. Let's go back and talk about Garth Evans a little bit, because we mentioned him Please. and didn't, didn't uh, spend much time. So. So, you know, some people who might be avid history, uh, barbershop history nerds like me may have looked and seen pictures of him. But tell us about the man so that we, we can feel like we know him a little bit. Well, in my mind, Steve, the greatest accolade I can offer someone is Joe, you are Joe Barbershopper. Joe Barbershopper to me means you accomplish things, you stand on a fairly high plane uh, in, the, in, our small, uh, in our small pond, our small world, but you sing with anybody, you, you talk to anybody, you don't feel superior to anybody. Gareth Evans was Joe Barbershopper. When he came to us, he was a, quite a renowned quartet singer and came over and uh, just stepped in and, and, and fit in perfectly. Because Ruth Maris had been that, medalists, right? Had been medalists, yeah. that's correct, yeah. yeah. With Gareth singing baritone right. at one point. And Jeff Pritchard also in that quartet, because we mentioned Jeff. Jeff Pritchard, absolutely. Yeah. You know, if you look back over all your time, the Ontario District and um, 
could have could sit down and have dinner with three people plucked from any moment in time, you know, current or past. Um, who would those three guys be? My first thought was what I'd really like to do was that old quartet of mine. I'd like to get together with, uh, with Jack Nash, Eddie Russell, and Jimmy Russell, Jimmy's dead, and just talk about those days, those early days, and the things we learned and the things we saw and did, and the laughs we had, and, and the silly things we did and so on when we were young and foolish and new, and I'd really like to do that. But if I come to people that I admired, I would, my first thought obvious, automatically goes to George Shields. But I'm going to set that aside because he's kind of special, and I have been able to continue to see George on a regular basis till right. now. So I'll go past that, and I'll say, I give honorable mention to Al Shields, his older brother, who died way back when in 78, I think. Yeah, so tell us a bit about Al Shields. I joined in the fall of 76, so Al Shields was still alive for he maybe was. a couple of years then, but I, right. I don't think I ever met him. I've seen pictures of him, and I, and I know how much people loved him. Al was a beer salesman. I mean, that yeah, was his job. And he would go around to... Uh, to hotels with men's rooms and he would buy for the, the group. Now, he, he was sold for Dow, which went belly up somewhere along the way. So he would, he would buy a Dow for everybody in the room. But Al was a funny man. He was a happy man. He was a pleasant man. Greg Backwell would certainly be one. Greg is a, one of the most accomplished people I've ever met, if not the I mean, he does everything he does well. He was a superior athlete. He was an artist. He was a self-taught musician and an arranger. And, of course, all the things of the Nighthawks were greatly due to, to Greg. So Greg would be one. I've spoken of Greg over the years and spent time with him. But I could, I could pick his brain a little bit more and be happy. Yeah. He would be one. Another would be would be Huey Palmer. Huey Palmer. You you've mentioned Huey Palmer to me before. I have. When I when I joined, I think in the early '60s, Huey was our district president. Huey was blind. It was as though he didn't care he was blind. He didn't know he was blind. He was just as normal and pleasant and funny as anybody. He never complained about anything, and just, just a wonderful, wonderful man. I admired that. He was, had a great sense of humor, and well, that, I, I, I can't forget that. And the third one would be Jeff Pritchard, who we've talked about briefly right. during this time, and Jeff was Joe Barbershopper, absolutely and for sure. That's a good group for dinner. Could I drop in? Can I just pull up a chair near the table? You absolutely could. <laughs> you absolutely could. So let's go back. So when the Dukes won, then in 77, um, you know, I mentioned that I joined in 76. So um, my first fall contest was when the Dukes won the right to go to, to Philadelphia. I think it was Ray's first time directing the chorus. It was. Um, the, the people were laughing because you guys said uh, uh, on the Saturday Night Show, uh, Goodbye My Lady Love, and it's like Ray wasn't so sure about the choreography, he's looking over his shoulder trying to get that. I don't know if that was really true, but that's what people said. Um, and then, of course, you went, all our hopes were with you to go and be the first Canadian group to, to win a gold medal, and then you did. And so, I mean, what was that like then when you came back home and, and all of that experience? Well, again, you know, at the risk of being terribly trite, it's not the destination, it's the journey. And, there's, right. and that is terribly trite, but maybe it's so trite because it's so true. Because there's no question, I mean, it was, it was great. Honestly, when we stood on that stage, that was another arena, 
and they had, I don't know if you remember or not, or have seen, huge uh, squared out uh, speakers that face, and there are two or three of them down the, down the length of, and they faced in all directions, and the feedback was phenomenal. Okay. So we stood in that stage and I could hear immediately the feedback. Even standing in the chorus, was, wasn't the same as being the director, but standing in the chorus, I could hear it and I, I would have been shocked if we hadn't won. Let me change that. I knew we'd won. Right. Because it was, it was really as good as we could be. So anyway, all in all, I, that, that's how it was. It was nice. Yeah. But what had happened along the way, Right. that's what I remember and right. cherish. You, you can't just take that one moment. It, when you think of that gold medal, I'm sure you think about all of those experiences and all of those relationships and everything for the 20 plus years leading up to it. And it was a great moment, don't misunderstand. Oh, I, yeah. It was, it was a, a culmination of, of something, uh, something that we never expected to happen. I, I really I understand that completely. Yeah. You know, when, sure. when, um, when we had won those silver medals consecutively and I thought we were, a championship was imminent and then it didn't, we started to move further away from that. I was completely at peace with the idea that uh, we were never gonna win, but th that w it was a pretty great, great uh, a time that we had. Um, but then when we did, it was just kind of a nice, kind of, uh, uh, you know, completion of... It is, your, it is. It's a, it's, it's the summit, yeah. as it were. So, no, but then, but you had a, a, an additional summit. You went back and won it again three years later. And um, I've heard stories that, and tell me if this is true. I've heard stories that leading up to the contest and maybe even during the week, there, things just weren't really clicking. It wasn't... Um, it wasn't at a level that was gonna, gonna do the job, and Jim Miller came in and gave a, a big speech to the guys, and that had a lot to do with. <coughs> it didn't hurt, that's for sure. Yeah, he talked about you know, the responsibility was, of being a champion. And I have said over and over again that, uh, and I've said to you, I think, my, my three favorite uh, chorus directors, most admired, are all named Jim. And that would be Miller, Clancy, and more, more recently, G Jim, Henry. Jim Henry, of course, yeah. thank you. Yeah. yeah, Jim Miller was a big moment for us. And the other one was, I think, uh, I don't know if it was that year or not, but I think it was, Bob Johnson came in and spoke to our breakfast. He said, I shouldn't be here, but for you guys, I'm gonna do this. So that was, that was definitely a, a, a morale booster as well. But you know what, at that time, there was a lot of people saying, oh, this is wrong. The, the thoroughbreds, the vocal majority, and the Dukes are just gonna keep circulating. Right. And actually, I think actually, Freddie King said that to me at one point. I said, Fred, I don't think so. It's easy to, to get stuck in the now and think it's always going to be like this. And it never is. It, no, no. And, and you know, uh, choruses rise and fall. You, you talked about Jim Clancy in the many, many years of just going back and winning. That is remarkable. It's, Absolutely. It's, you know, it, it, it's so much not, not the norm. You know, choruses rise and fall. They have a, they have a, <coughs> a, a, a time in the sun sort of thing, right? And a lot of that's tied around the, the director, but also it's the chorus, there's an energy and a hunger when they haven't ever done that. And it's harder exactly. the second time, isn't it? Yes, it is. Yeah. And now, uh, after that, uh, there were many, many more years winning medals, six more medals, and you directed some of those, right? I directed the last three because we had the infamous uh, Bowling speech, the bowling, the bowling speech one night, the meltdown. <laughs> yeah. And so Ray, uh, Ray just got tired of hammering at it, hammering at it. And the guys were not responding very well, and he just got frustrated and left. Right. I called him and said, 
hobby if I do the warm up or I'll do the first half, you do the second half, you take your choice or vice versa. And he said, no, I don't want to do it, You're, it's yours. And I said, I don't want it to be mine. <laughs> However, I did and just to try to keep it going and we did three more, yeah. And I enjoyed that, but at the end of it, when it wasn't because we were, we were fifth in 89, it honestly wasn't, I'd more than had enough. Yeah, I understand. So consequently, uh, we, we switched. And you took it over, and I thank you for that to this day. And unfortunately, you didn't have time to yeah. uh, get your, your get into the concept, as it were. Yeah, there was, you know, I, I look back on that, and um, I was young and excited about this incredible chorus that I was going to have an opportunity to direct. Um, and I had, a, I had some... Uh, undeveloped skills and I, I needed time to develop them and so when, exactly. but when we came in sixth um, you know following that run of all the medals that one spot from fifth to sixth was really hard I know me. it's like coming yeah. forth at the Olympics isn't it yeah 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 and you were you were very gracious and you wrote me a very nice uh, I? letter when I when it when I when I chose to step away uh, I, was, I, was th uh, I was there for three years, uh, but you wrote a really nice letter. It was, it was always has meant a lot to me, and I thank you for that. Well, I, um, I don't recall, but you're most welcome. Well, I, I could say all kinds of things that you put in that letter then, couldn't I? <laughs> no, it, it truly it did, did mean a lot. Um, and it was it's one of those things I look back on now, I can understand that all of that experience played an important role in me learning to be a better director. Yeah, I think you were... You were maybe a bit desperate because of the situation. We asked too much of you. Well, yeah. W well, whatever it was, um, I don't think I would have experienced what I did after that if I hadn't had that experience. So I, I, I have no regrets about it. And, and, and I was still, it was incredibly honored to direct this amazing chorus. I do. I have regrets about it. I'm, as I say, I think that was a, a definite mistake. Well... It's all good. It's all good. And, you know, yeah, exactly. we've become uh, uh, um, much closer friends over the last few years, and I've really appreciated that. Now, um, one of the chapters in Ontario District uh, that has been a wonderful chapter for many, many, many years, but is a little bit separated from us geographically, is the Ottawa chapter. And you ended up, even though you continued to live in Toronto, you ended up directing them uh, when... When was that? Was that in the 90s? I wish I could tell you. You know, when somebody says to me, when was that? I normally say in the past. <laughs> unless, it was, unless it was a real milestone, like 77 and 80 and so on. Right. Well, it had to be, it certainly was after 89 because you directed the Dukes then. So it, must, it was late 90s, early 2000s probably. Probably, probably. Yeah. They got in touch with me and said, uh, we need a director, would you consider coming? I said, really? And they had a plan. They were going to fly me up every two weeks. And I could stay with Jack Nash, who is now my original lead, an old buddy to this day. Uh, I could stay with Jack, which I loved. And that was, that was kind of the thing that got me there. Spending more, when Jack and I would sit after, at his place after practice and sit up till 6 o'clock in the morning until I had to go and get on a plane to go home. And I loved that, I loved those moments. So I did it on that basis, and, but it just didn't work. I mean, I, the first time I took them into competition, they scored higher than they'd ever scored before, and that was nice. But I wasn't there every day, I wasn't a part of them, and it just wasn't working. Okay. So eventually I said, guys, this isn't working. I, I, you need to, you need to get somebody who can be here every week. Cool. Dave Forrester, who I, another guy I admire, Joe Barber Shopper. Um, Dave, uh, Dave would do the weeks when I wasn't there. And that was good, and I thought it would really work, but my influence was limited, and Dave didn't really want to do it. He was doing it because to help out. Right. So consequently, it was, it was nice. I enjoyed it. It was, it was uh, nothing I regret. I'm glad I did it. Met some, some more great people Absolutely. and got reacquainted with some more great people. Yeah, yeah I mean, that would be cool just to 
uh, people that we tend to see twice a year get to interact with them, uh, you know, every week or however often you were going up there and, and, and just make deeper friendships, you know. It, uh, exactly. Yeah. You mentioned Harmony College, and I, I did want to talk about that because you served on the faculty at Harmony College many years. And in fact, um, I mentioned to you earlier uh, the famous What Are We Trying to Preserve video that Dave Stevens made. Um, if people w look carefully, they can see a young Ron, Ron Whiteside in the front row of the faculty sitting behind Dave Stevens in your very attractive short shorts there. Um, well, <laughs> I was one of the few people there who could, have, could, could wear short shorts. You can carry that off. <laughs> You can carry on. Well, no, it, was, it, wasn't, it wasn't obscene in my case. <laughs> yeah. So um, you, you taught there for many years. Uh, uh, you know, what was that like? What, what, what was uh, Harmony College like in those days? It was, I guess it was casual. It was fun. Uh, there were, each year, as they probably still do, there was a faculty steak dinner somewhere yes. in which the faculty put on a show. Had a lot of laughs over that. A little yes. irreverent, probably you couldn't tell some of those stories. Right? Absolutely irreverent, absolutely irreverent. But, you know, again, met so many great people, that people with big names uh, that I got to know really well, and they were great people. Uh, there were some exceptions to that rule. But if I, 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 I mentioned Freddie King earlier, Freddie and I, we had a lot of laughs together. I would sit up. Many nights, we, the dorms at that time were four uh, two-man rooms right. with a central area where you could gather. And Lloyd Steinkamp and Fred and I would often sit up till four in the morning. And Lloyd insisted on it because it was okay for him. He had nothing to do until <laughs> noon. But Freddie and I had to work a little bit earlier. <clears throat> so anyway, telling jokes and just getting to know each other and so on. One t Jim Bagby used to, uh, used to get firecrackers every year because he lived nearby in Kansas City. Yeah. You get firecrackers any time. And Bagby would bring these firecrackers and we'd get a few laughs out of them and uh, use them in various ways. And one year, Bob Johnson went to bed early. <coughs> it, was, it was a Saturday night. So Freddie and I decided we'd get one, a big pile of these cannon crackers and we'd throw them under Bob's bedroom window <laughs> and then run. Because we sure as hell didn't, need, didn't want to get caught by Bob. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, we went and uh, we threw them. We're giggling to yeah. each other. It's worth mentioning to people who, who don't know anything oh, about Bob Johnson. Good point. That, um, so he was the director of music education, and he was um, on the grumpy side, you might want to say, right? Most assuredly. Yeah. Bob, Bob, to me, was, was right down the middle. He, he said he didn't hesitate to say things, to criticize, to, to say what he thought, but that was okay for me. Right. And a lot of people didn't like him. He's not someone that you wanted to be mad at you. <laughs> Just so. And Freddie, in fact, had had that experience. He and Lloyd had been cut out of the faculty once right. and then invited back again. So you, you threw the firecrackers. <laughs> Indeed. And then the other guy, Bob was in the, in the quadrangle across from us, and the other guys are all waiting for this to happen and watching through the <laughs> curtains see what happens. Freddie and I took off across the field, and he always said to me after that, from after that night, I beat you. You're supposed to be an athlete, and I beat you. <laughs> I, I had flip-flops on. You had running shoes. <laughs> anyway, so now we come back around the other way and come in the back door, and we look out, and Bob has come out, and there's no question he took a few minutes to get ready. He had a, a red and white striped night shirt and a nightcap. Well, that... That showed that he was, he was right on to the whole thing. Yeah, that was, that was a heap of fun. Anyway, all in all, it was, it was a great experience. But it came to the point where enough was enough for me. So I told Joe Lyles, uh, who was in charge of it, I said, I'm not, I'm not going to be back, Joe. Anyway, then Mel Knight took it over. And uh, he called me, I think in June, said, Ron, can you come down? Harmony College. I said, no, Mel, I don't want to. I've had enough. 
Now I want you to come down and, and do the advanced director's school or class. Advanced director? Listen, I know nothing about directing Mel. Well, you've directed Medalist Corps. That's not the point. <laughs> I know nothing about directing. I, don't, I wouldn't know what to do. Kept calling maybe the third time, it was two weeks before. He said, Ron, I've got to have you. I can't get anybody else. Okay. So I went down and I had two classes and I said to them at the beginning, I can't teach you how to direct. I'm not going to get you up here and, uh, and take videos of you because I can't criticize them. I can't critique them. So what I'm going to do is say to you what my philosophy of directing is, and that is be a communicator. Listen and be a communicator. Listening is a major part of communicating. Watch what the guy's faces are showing. Watch how they react. Listen to what they have to say. I used to have what I called de designated complainers, who I'd say, if something bothers you, please come and tell me. Right. Pe people think it's all about the conducting technique, which is, of course, is important, Absolutely. but the communication and the leadership skills, you certainly could teach people how to do that. And I know you had some, some guys who went on to do some pretty good things after that. Well, in fact, I, I had in my one class, I had Jack Slamka and Mike Slamka, yeah. and Mike was a star in the group. They, they chose him to direct. We wanted to show how good we'd become, and we went around to the other classes and sang. Mike directed so I got to know them pretty well at that point. I didn't know till later that one of the other members of that class was Jim Henry. Awesome. I was. So actually I learned that from Mike in later years. <laughs> so I now tell, oh, by the way, I should tell during this, I was a very strong influence in getting those two men started on their careers. You taught them everything they know? I don't think everything, most, but I, most, I think most, most, important, would, important stuff. most would be the proper word. And yes. so this seems like a, the perfect way to wrap up. We started talking about your humility. <laughs> and there you go. <laughs> so, Ron, this has been, um, it's been delightful for me. I, I mean, just sitting here talking to you um, is reward enough, but knowing that we've been able to capture some of this in um, uh, people in the district and beyond will learn some of the Ontario District history uh, through your experiences and also learn more about you and, and the contributions you've made, which have been uh, immense. Well, thank you. thank you so much, Steve. And I, I appreciate all that you and, and the committee have done to set this thing up. Again, uh, when I was chosen for this, it was a bit of a who, who me moment. It honestly was. And you could very well have been this this me like I could have been interviewing you. Well, thank you. Just I, just as readily. I'm I'm getting a kick out of doing doing this part and yeah. You know, good. Who knows? Maybe for the hundredth, I'll I'll, I'll I'll sit there and someone else can. You're doing it very well. Yeah. Yeah, maybe I can do that for the hundredth. All right, it's a deal. <laughs> but we'll we won't we won't count on it. If I don't make it, just go ahead without me. <laughs> okay. All right, thank you. Thank you, Ron. It's been great. Thanks so much, and thanks for having me, it's, as, they, as we say these days. And that's true. Thanks for having me. I enjoyed the process. And let's keep it going on a less formal basis. Let's do that. Yeah. So this has been um, uh, a wonderful time uh, together uh, uh, visiting with Ron. As I mentioned, uh, we're, we're interviewing uh, several iconic barber shoppers, And so if you enjoyed this uh, this time together, I hope that you'll uh, want to seek out those other videos and watch them too and learn more about the Ontario District history as we celebrate 75 years. Thank you for listening.